Welcome back to Prime Your Midlife. One of the things that I know men get stuck with, in fact, lots of people in midlife, is they just can't quite find the next step for breakthrough. And today I've got Sam Sharma with us, who is a specialist at enabling people to see the path and see the way and then take action on how to make the first step become all the steps that becomes breakthrough. Sam Sharma, welcome to our Primal Midlife show today. How are you? Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me today. I'm doing really well. Thank you. Well, I, first of all, anybody who's listening, I went into one of Sam's masterclasses last Friday and it was just full of excellent, easy to understand frameworks. And it's not often that I leave a masterclass writing furiously things that I need to apply. So I am looking forward to this, not just from the show's perspective, from a selfish perspective, but if I think I'm going to get something to learn here today. I'm bigging you up here, Sam. No pressure. No. <laughs> None taken. <laughs> All right, let's get straight into the uh, the first question I often ask people. And this word crisis is associated often with midlife. Are you a believer of crisis or mindset in terms of this pattern interrupt that happens to us in our sort of 40s and 50s? What do you think? Well, firstly, it's fascinating that you use the 40s and 50s because I feel like that happened to me in my 30s. So uh, it's midlife is not kind of a specific midpoint, but it's actually can take place when when you, what you believe to be true, you come against that to say, well, actually, that's not true at all. And whatever I believe has done nothing but created a lot of inner conflicts. So at the time, it feels like crisis, but when I reflect back now, it was one of the greatest opportunities presented to me. That's well, tell us about that then. So you were in your third stuff, you were a, a banker at the time, is that that's right? right? That's correct, yeah. So I was working in an investment bank, the job, the stress, everything just was so much. And at one point, I just, I just remember a conversation with my dad. He's telling me that you've got everything. Why are you still not happy? And I said, dad, I don't know. All I know is that I can't sleep at night. And later in life, I reflected back on those moments that I used to get sweaty palms. And there was this sign of PTSD that when I was under stress, my body was kind of releasing these toxins. And that was leading me to be constantly being in the state of anxiety. Stress was always part of parts of it, but I was told to buckle up because that's the way everyone does it. So just carry on the way you've been doing, leading your life. And if you can't hack it, that means something's wrong with you rather than you, the, there is the opportunity they're sitting for you to be working on. So that was leading to creating creation of a lot of inner conflict that was pulling me apart in two different directions. You know, following, trying to be this man who needs to provide, needs to be a role model, we had a little baby at the time as well. So all of those things versus performance at work and not getting any good feedback on the performance or being secluded from the, the go-to people or that groupism that was there. So you feel like pulled in multiple directions. Hence, at that time, it was a serious crisis and I didn't even know that was a crisis. And where were those thoughts? You talked about that word, everyone. Where, where or who was this everyone that was creating this archetypal man's view of how you needed to provide, which is the words you use there. Who is this everyone that you were being pressured into making these decisions for? Yeah, yeah. So so it tends to happen from your childhood, right? You're brought up in certain cultures, civilizations, and the, the narrative of a society of who you are and what your role is in the society plays its part. Uh, now, me, I came from a very different background to probably yourself, as well as a lot of your viewers, perhaps. But I also lived in 19 different countries that had its own interplay of the mind playing with me and understanding of the, this culture, that culture, then meeting my wife who's coming from another culture. So although I'm a very, I call myself a global citizen, but it has a cost, it has a price to pay. And that price to pay is to identify who am I as a person? How do I need to show up? right? How to be politically right as well as right at home. <laughs> so all of those part was somewhere in the childhood, there is this deep, deep image of my dad seeing him do all these things. And then my wife looking up to me to where she sees me actually to play that role. You know, mm -hmm. She looks up to me to play that role. Uh, so a combination of factors that makes you want to play that role yourself because you start to think, 
well that's how i should be that's how i ought to be right get educated get the right jobs you know get the mortgage and just follow the sequence it's so designed path and that's exactly what i was following till my breakdown took place well we're going to talk about how you enable people to get through those points but i'm curious that conversation you had with your father was that the first one that you had when you actually began to say actually this isn't serving me in terms of a human so that was the first uh, conversation i can recall where i paused up till that point i only knew one direction which was i need to gain these qualifications and these corporate titles and this much money i need to earn to justify my existence but it was the only first point i can recall now that i paused and i asked and i said to my dad that i don't know why i'm not happy mm. something's not right that's it that's all mm. i knew at that point in my life it was later 3 weeks later after that conversation when i fainted in my job was when the big red flag came that something is definitely not right mm. and i mm. knew i'm not going back in those environments again it's just something got switched off for me it was like i'm done i'm just done i'm not going back to those environments and and i remember a conversation with my manager at the time and he was a he was an ex uh, air force pilot actually he had an accident and he couldn't b- go back in the air force mm. and he said to me i said to him look i'm done and he said no you're not now i can reflect back and say he was so right because he had that mindset he had been through and he said to me you know you're not done but at the time it was complete crisis till you go through that darkness this uh, I, i don't know if you seen uh, the, the the hero's journey yeah the trifangal talk spoke speaks about that you go through this dark phase in your life and you don't see the light till you, but you need to keep walking through it you find different mentors come along the way who guide you through you know who, who sometimes just give you a one liner that changes your perspective and it was only when i came out on the other side when i wrote my first book that was the first light for me that first moment in which i was in a zone where nothing mattered other than just the book was coming through me and i was just typing it in and what do you think the consequences would have been had you had listened to your father who said come on sam you're so happy you how, how can you possibly think this way well, looking back now what do you think the consequences would have been to you or your health or your relationship had you not mm-hmm. decided to think i need to do something different well in my case that question didn't occur till my health really collapsed you know when i actually fainted at 33 i knew something's gone now right that conversation was only like a red flag moment for me but after that the red flag became too real for me when i mentally couldn't go back in those environments to work back but if i would have carried on by now i probably would be very ill i i remember in fact i recall one of the guys retiring and he walking outside the building 3 weeks later he committing suicide his whole yes. identity was coming from the title he was holding inside that building itself he had mm. nothing outside of that building and that was the one moment when i thought you know what i'm absolutely nobody outside i might be a vp inside this building but when i step outside i have zero skills on how to sell myself mm. i only had well, not only but still i had very technical project skills i didn't had skills on how to how to sell myself how to connect the dots how to see the patterns and how to actually tap on to my intuitive genius i didn't know how to tap on to those energies because the mind was too busy too consumed by trying to kind of climb this thing trying to win this thing trying to seek that external validation trying to look at the bonuses i will get so it was way too lost in that equation Mm. I would have ended up most probably like some of the, my family members, you know, not which is not a bad thing. They are okay, but I see that they are they're mostly slaves. They are not yeah. really living the life. They don't have a life. They just work all the time, and they don't have. I mean, I do work a lot, but I work on my multiple businesses. It's mm. a different energy, you know. The more I work, the more I want to work. It just flows through me. It doesn't feel like effort at all. and i can manage that along with the family life and the health and fitness routines 
So it's it's a sweet spot. And suddenly it feels like, well, actually, I'm only working a couple of hours. You're working all the hours in the week to earn as much as something disconnects there. Mm. So I do speak about it in my book as well, where I spoke about uh, the words in Hindi uh, for servant is knocker. The word for uh, job in Hindi is knockery. So the language itself was telling us that if you are doing a nokri, you are actually being a slave of someone. Mm. Yet you couldn't connect the dots till you are on the other side. Okay. There's a few people that are probably listening and going, yes, but, yes, but, Sam, you're probably, you know, you're an investment banker. You had money in the bank. I'm trapped by my job, I'm trapped by my partner, I'm trapped by my lifestyle. And they're so close to the painting that they can't pull back and see the big picture. And then they get even more trapped and that you know, end of life strategy becomes part of their way out of this trap. So what would you do to speak to that person that's listening to say, yes, but Sam, hmm. So using the experience you, you've not, yeah. now got of your models and other things. Hmm. No, no, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Investment banking is something that happened to me later on. But prior to that, I was an international student with 23,000 pounds debt, borrowed money to start a journey of life. By the time I had the first decent job, I was already in 49,000 pounds debt, right? So I want you to put things in perspective here. You don't get that much salary when you're starting up your career, but you have that much debt. As, and I had borrowed money from an uncle of mine to study abroad. So he was asking for the money back. So I had to go to the bank to take the loans out. So it wasn't as, and this is one of the things I talk about in my first book, was called the money life coaching because what I understood in that moment was that I can't start my life. If I'm starting my life on a back foot, forget about building anything else because how many other people are doing exactly the same with the concept that, well, when you have a job, just pay the minimum on student, uh, student loans and stuff like that. So for me, it wasn't as simple, but what I understood was, A, I need to have high paying skills. That was fundamental for me and I, I mean, as you are, Chris, we are, we love learning and development. For me, it was really, really important to gain certain skills. So I studied day and night. I had three jobs at a time. In fact, there was times I was working 18 hours a day just to get on top of my game. You know, everything, all, every single penny was connected to pay something off or to acquire certain skills. This went on for about three years. And I speak about it in my book as well and how how organized I was with every single penny to pay things off and get on top of my game. While do, uh, doing that, I was working and studying to gain high qualified skills. And that was when I passed my Prince II exam, which was for project management qualification. Once I passed that, I was able to break into that barrier where my salary was the same as the amount of money I owed to others. For the first time, I was no longer playing a game of you know, five, six, 10 pound an hour. It was about the outcome or the value that I was creating for the organization and they were paying me the relevant amount of money that I needed to earn on that level of income, right? And I, I went in there and I thought, and it was completely by accident. I got an opportunity as a contractor and as a contractor, it was a daily rate that was given to me to hit those marks. I learned very fast that I can move from contract to contract to contract Without increasing my expenses, living within my means, getting rid of my debt became my first priority. So by the time I was, I was, I think it was around 26, 27, I was completely out of the debt. And I had a complete new, new beginning to life. And I, at that time, I had already gained experience and skills to go and earn even more in the banking world, especially in technology. So I was able to bring it all together and just make that, that edge thing happen. And as that happened, I was, I've actually brought it all together in the book because I modeled this. I was really good at modeling stuff. And I was like, if I can do it, anyone can do it. That's why I kind of, uh, in my first book, I talked to students a lot, people who are in their final years, uh, ed university education. So they, they get the headset right as they're moving forward. Mm. Because the reality of life will catch up sooner or later as the student life finishes. 
those who are very aware of who they are and what they're doing, they're likely to take the right steps and they will come out of these debt cycles. They will, they will think in the right way. Yeah. So, so to, to help your viewers to understand, it's not all that rosy journey. Investment banking is at multiple levels. You don't start at the top of the range. You start at the bottom where you don't get paid that much. You work your way as you attain skills, but the mm. mind is open to learning and development. And that's the growth mindset that we all ought to develop is what I will encourage everyone. A hundred percent. I heard a beautiful quote, I think in the last week, which said ideation that doesn't then translate into execution is as good as hallucination. Um, with that in mind, Sam, how did you go from crisis to to sort of three books later and now helping businesses go to six figures. Can you talk about those steps that you took or even the first step that you took from staring into yourself, knowing that you've just fainted and thinking this isn't working to where you, not where you are now, but just this point, people are saying, how do I step off the treadmill sap? What do I do first? There's so much that I need to do. And I'm just almost in freeze because I don't know which point to, to take first. And there's all these magnets about this model and this model and do that and do this. And this is the route to freedom. What could you advise as the first so, step? So here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We all have uh, some sort of a genius, but we tend to spend time not staying in those genius zones most of the time. In fact, if you look at to, your to-do list, your to-do list can be broken into four parts. The first part will be below competence, something you really are not into it. At competence, you do it for the sake of doing it. At excellence, you've trained yourself, you've experienced, you've qualified to do that. At any of these three areas, below competence, at competence, or at excellence, you're likely to burn yourself out because after a while you create frustrations and conflicts within yourself. But at genius, this energy flows through you. So my first question to you would be, what is the kind of things you do when time flies by? Mm -hmm. You love yeah. it so much that the more you do it, the more you want to do it. That's your first clue in understanding that this is where your intuitive genius lies. When you tap onto that energy and you learn to commercialize that, you set up a business. That's the part a lot of people don't understand. Hence, they end up at best being self-employed gigs. It's not even a business or an entrepreneurship. They're just doing self-employed. They went from job into creating a job for themselves in their business. So where's your passion? Where's, what flows through you naturally where you don't get stuck, you don't get hung up, and the more you do it, the more you want to do it. If you can answer that, or if you can't answer that, ask others around you, because they will tell you what where, where you lose yourself. They'll tell you, your partners will tell you that, like, this is, comes to you naturally. Have you mm -hmm. ever thought about doing something with that talent? I'll give you an example. My my work for my wife for many years worked as a sales manager for an automotive firm, but her talent was in beauty. So over when the COVID came, she retrained herself to be a uh, it's a skin specialism. I forgot what it's called specifically, but it's basically face facial treatments by using certain machines. She retrained in that and started her own business on a part-time basis, right? Because this flows through her. This is so natural for her. And now, two years later, she has been able to match the income in from her job as well as the income from her business. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the idea is that she will have to let go of the job because she needs to be in her genius zone. She's really good with hands. Let her use that talent of spotting the skin treatments of what people need to get better. That, that's just an example. Chris, does that does that answer your question? It, it does completely. Um, I'm just curious from your perspective, mm -hmm. how do you challenge procrastination? Because so many people have these big ideas about, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to go and be a beauty therapist, and I'm, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, and yet we'll walk into 2025 and they've still got the aspiration. Yeah. And they'll say to somebody else, I wish I could do that. But yeah. they seem to want to get in this self-perpetuating cycle of I can't because of, yeah. as opposed to I can. 
Yeah. So this is this is one of the one of the key things. Procrastination. It's 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 as bad as COVID was. It spreads. It's addictive, and we get caught up in this. And especially in societies where a lot of things are taken care of, the people lack drive. Especially our kids, when you provide them for everything, they just lack the drive. They don't have the hunger in them to actually push themselves forward. But the challenge is procrastination is the biggest thief of time. And time is the only asset we have that is depreciating for all of us. When you realize that, in that moment for when I collapsed on the, on the floor and I had to rebuild myself, I knew the only thing I have is time. That's all I had. And because I couldn't see the vision ahead, all I knew was I have just one day. If you just forget about everything and just come to, you put that one day only in your hand. What is it that you should be doing right now with your life? You know, and it's something happens at an internal level. Some people are driven. Some people are hungry for my, for example, in my case, as a child, I only got approval when I got, when I performed. The more better the grades, the more the scores or the, in sports, the, the cricket scores or the, the 100 meters running I used to do, the better I performed in it, the more approval I got. The same pattern carried on when I was in a in a banking world. The bigger the bonus, the better I feel about myself because there's approval, external validation coming. But the consequences of either of this is burnout or injuries because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Mm. So mm -hmm. the, when it comes to procrastinations, and I can go into the real reasons for that, but actually, if you were to tap into your why, why am I doing something? Why do I need to be doing it? And why comes from WHY? what hurts you whatever hurts you first you're likely to get up and fix it that's human condition mm -hmm. right so identify the procrastination might be coming from your goals are not right in the first place you know they were too lofty goals or you were looking at others while designing it for others needs and you didn't even think about where you are in your life right now you be, you might be completely distracted while you're doing these things you, you could have things like perfectionism where you are looking to just wait for the perfect scenarios for you to get up and do something. You know, you may have a lot of inner conflicts like fear or self-doubt kicking in. You don't know how to action plan it. You don't know how to write the steps, break it into the smallest steps and make that one step happen. But overall, it comes, Chris, it all comes down to identifying or having that self-awareness to know this is my problem. Procrastination is my problem. Mm. And I need to trick my mind into overriding it. Whether I do it through a reward-based system, right? So for example, if I need to get up in the morning and go to the gym, and your brain's going to come, brain's really clever, right? As you know, it's not responsible for our success. It's only responsible to keep us alive. So to get us out of that comfort zone where the growth is, you need to trick it. And the trick is you outthink the reasons it will come up with as excuses. For example, uh, I need to get up in the morning. Well, have your shoes, bags, car, alarms, everything ready. So there's no reason for it to trick you. Look at the weather. It's going to rain tomorrow or not. Plan ahead. As you plan ahead and you put measures in place, you mitigate that risk of your brain telling you, well, you know what? Forget it. You shouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. One of the key things we talk about is, uh, in fact, I think if you if you recall in my in the conversations we had, uh, let's see if I can make that make that come up here. One of the key things we look here is our mind only understands the language of our thoughts, and our thoughts are made up of two different things. One is the visuals, what we see is what we get, and the other is the scripts. Our spoken and unspoken words. All the combination of this creates emotions in us. Emotions can be really triggered, high driven, positive emotions, or they could be completely flat, leading to complete procrastination. This action, taking of action or lack of action results in habits. Habits leads to building of our character and character leads to where life or how life looks like right now for you. So the reality you have right now, it just didn't occur. It happened long way ago where the thoughts were created, right? But if you look at this model very closely and 
after the thought stage comes the emotions. What I encourage people to do is override the emotion and take the action. Because the flip side of that is after taking action, you will release another emotion. And that emotion is likely to going to be triggering a series of positive emotions. So taking ir action irrespective of how we feel is fundamental in the game theory of high performance. 100%. I'm just curious, when you had your epiphany of a change, did you then share that with your wife at the time? Uh, she is not, I, I couldn't open up but she could see what I was going through. You said you couldn't open up. Correct. When people are too close to you, these people, one of the key lessons that I learned was your wife is not your counselor. Mm -hmm. Stop. Stop treating her like your counselor. She's not paying for your childhood pain. She's not your therapist. She was your partner at the time when you were at your high. She needs to see you through your lows, but she's still not a therapist. Mm -hmm. She may not have those resources herself. So you, you shouldn't be burdening her with all that. At the same time, you can get external help. You can get other help, but she's there with you. And I, I wrote this in my book. My wife said to me that you're going through a dark phase, but I'm there with you. I may not know what to say to you or what to, how to help you at times, but I'm there with you. And that was the thing that completely changed my view. Well, it's a beautiful reflection of the partnership that you clearly have and one of the areas that concerns me sometimes is that when people share their innermost feelings of vulnerability and then the partner then smacks them down to say sam hang on a minute you're, you're supposed to be this you know this this strong man and the person that provides for the family and you can't let your father down and then they almost go back into the archetypal role model that they think that they should be because of the conditioning of those you know, 19 countries that you've been through and all of that experience. But then the, the procrastinator in them says, hang on a minute, Sam, you're not being authentic with yourself. You're now burying, burying your own desire to become a better person of you. And, that, and that's an even worse cycle to be in. Hmm, interesting. Uh... So what's the specific question here, would you say? But I was just reflecting with you how it's it was good that your your partner was able to have that understanding of how you were feeling, but she didn't then stop you from then uh, allowing you to pursue your path. Yeah, yeah, I, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. You, you're absolutely right. Certain partners will give up, you know, but I do think that people who come from families where they've seen their parents struggle and still stick together, they are likely to follow their parents' path on sticking together no matter what happens. Mm. So, so, she, so just the fact that her presence stayed there while I went through my turmoil on the other side, uh, it really helps to have a strong person around you because she could keep the family together. Yeah. It helps. What, one of the things we talked about last week in your masterclass, and I'm going to ask you to... The failure cycle is something that really resonated with with me of somebody that has often thought, oh, I, I must try this and oh, oh, that's, that's the thing that's going to work. Oh, that's the thing that I've got to do. And we almost jump off what we think is the right thing because something else looks better. Can you tell us about why that is not maybe the right thing to do in terms of letting something go too quickly? Yeah, yeah. So fail, first failure cycle, I'll quickly, for the benefit of your audiences, I'll explain. Failure cycle, essentially a pattern that exists in our psyche. You can call it failure, you can call it rejection, whatever you want to call it. The idea is very simple, that whatever, whenever we start something new, we get super excited about it. But after some time, that excitement kind of fades away, and we start to avoid, defer, or delay on doing the same things that was getting us super excited in the past. Once we're avoiding something we were loving in the past, our brain's really clever. It says, give me a reason, justify why am I avoiding? So we come up with the reasons. Some people call it reasons, I call them excuses. I don't have time, I don't have enough money, I, it's blah, 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 whatever you name it, it's an excuse. And eventually when you run out of excuses, your brain says, right, I need to point the finger at someone else because I need to blame something outside of me for why it didn't work out for me. So I can find the next new thing to be excited about. 
And then we repeat the same pattern all over again. You know, new house, new wife, new car, new job, new client, you name it, our behaviors change over time. And that's what this is all about. That's the failure pattern, okay? Now, the idea is very simple. You can call it failure or how do you separate being in failure cycle versus when is it time to pull the plug and say, you know what? I've tried everything with this. I need to cut my losses here and try something else. That's an act of courage. For example, I did my banking world and for months after finishing my banking life, I kept on thinking, why did I not get to retire in the bank? Sounds funny, right? But trust me, in the banking culture, when you're part of the furniture, part of the corporate, you want, you look up to people who retire with a golden watch. You look up to these people because you can see how their career went and who they became, blah, blah, blah. So you're surrounded by a very specific mindset of rising through corporate hierarchy. So, so for many months, I stayed in that kind of regret that why, what, what where did I go wrong? Why could I not be that person who lasted that long in this environment? But my body told me otherwise. One of my greatest coach, Simon, he got to, made me think that who I was versus what I was doing was two different things. And I need to let go of the corporate and make my own modeling, make my own thinking come alive through models. You know, and that was the key, fun, key part for me where I started to think that what am I good at and what can I do that flows through me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So act of courage either will come through in natural reasons. In my case, it was my own mental or physical body giving up on me, or it will come through inner conflicts like symptoms that you can't sleep at night and you don't feel right about something. You feel that your intuition is always guiding you. We just need to pause and reflect back to hear what that inner self has to say to us. But we don't because we're so busy jumping from one thing to another to another. Yeah. Sometimes it's good to be alone. So if you are uh, someone in the middle midlife going through a crisis that you lost your partner and stuff like that, your relationship didn't work out, I think it could be one of the best opportunities. It could be one of the best opportunities. I didn't lose my relationship, but we had distance, you know, purely because I was in a different place. My heart and my mind needed to find that new Sam. I had to find my own purpose. What am I born for? I'm, I'm a calling driven person. I needed to find my own voice. Mm. So if you're going through that phase, I will encourage you. This is probably the best thing that has happened because it's time for you to rebuild yourself through self-awareness. At times in relationships, what tends to happen when, when male and female comes together, uh, a female looks for that alpha male, you know, so we put that alpha male mind or the body or the appearances in front. But over time, when partners becomes too comfortable, she starts to recognize you as a beta male, not an alpha male. Mm. She feels betrayed at times that, well, actually, I thought, you know, I thought you were that guy, but you're not really that guy. You're actually as vulnerable as someone else. And it's, I don't find that attractive. It's, it's all animal psychology. There's a lot of studies done on these alpha and beta males mindset for females, right? But it's time for you to be an alpha provided you stand in your calling. And that's the part people miss out on. We have tried to be alpha in areas that never flew through us. Mm -hmm. We were trying to be an artificial imposition of something that doesn't come to us naturally. But yeah. when we stand in our, our calling, there is no competition. This is my alpha because this energy flows through us. And that's the journey, Chris, we all ought to be taking as as men, I do think. That's what I think. Well, we, 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 we should be. And I, I'm 100% with you. Could you perhaps tell us a story of somebody that you've worked with because there's probably still somebody sat there going ah yeah but come on then uh, can you inspire us with somebody that you've worked with that has gone on the journey with you and is now a different person as a result of working with a, a third party which is a coach or a mentor to say we can be different yeah you see i work at multiple levels i'll give you an example a lot of female come and work with me. A lot of coaches come and work with me only because what I'm doing is I'm connecting the dots between three major areas that come to me naturally, which is high performance psychology, business strategies, and technology. So whenever I ask a question, what's the biggest barrier to your growth? Whatever the answer is, I can pretty much tell you it will fall in one of these three categories where the answer will be, right? So I remember Kim, 
Kim came to me. She was a, well, let's say, let's use the male example instead of Kim because uh, it's easy to use with your audiences, right? So you don't have to say his, his name. You could just make it up. Yeah, that's fine. James is such a common name, right? <laughs> so James came to me. He was, he was really struggling with his, uh, ran a business entrepreneur, but he was, he was very emotional about a lot of people. He brought in business. He used to get emotionally attached with people. But when people will not be able to live up to his expectations, he will get disappointed about not just them, but about, he will form belief systems about how everyone is like. And this is where we start to go wrong. So he had a lot of these emotions of feeling bad about rich people, you know, how they are doing so well. And, and those that envy, all those emotions he was holding on to, it was creating a lot of problems for him purely because A, he was not doing as well. Secondly, he was more outwardly focused than to work upon himself. As a consequence, you're burning yourself out because you're trying to catch up to do something you can't do. So I asked him a simple question, rich people are, complete that sentence, rich people are. And he said, they are bastards. And I was like, okay, so here's what's going to happen. When you come into money, you've got two things. One, you will either become exactly the person how you define them as, or you will self-sabotage and throw all the money away on the wrong things because you don't want to end up as that person. And he goes, this is exactly what I've been doing. He throws all the money away. He doesn't want to be rich because he thinks rich people, he will become a pastor and he doesn't want to be like them. So he throws all the money away. So this is one of the fundamental things we do is we understand people's patterns. Once I spot the pattern of what's driving your life or a belief system that's been running you and we replace that by a new pattern, which is what's the full version of the truth. The full version of the truth is well, some rich people are like this. Other rich people are incredible. Mm. What kind of rich person do you want to be? When we come from that place, Chris, it, it changes the game because now you're no longer held back by a negative belief systems holding you back, not trying, letting you feel free and earn the money and make the good things happen for yourself. That one pattern, once we broke, his business went from making 100,000 to 700,000, multiple six figures, that one pattern change and then implementation of strategies and then leveraging technology to bring it all together for him. Yeah. He's got one of the, for the last three years, he's won the Dorsex number one in his industry. Awards. The last three years running now. So mm -hmm. who is to say that you, me, we can't do all these amazing things. Sometimes all it takes is that one breakthrough. Well, it's that changing the script, isn't it? And in that scenario you talked about with James there, it's really leaning into the belief system that is running his life. And somebody somewhere told him that a rich person is not the person that, that perhaps he wants or likes to be. And once you told him to say rich people are not bastards, they are. They, they could be philanthropists. They could be enablers. They could be um, givers of, of many things in society. It was his breakthrough that allowed him to be different. Uh, and that's sometimes why working with a third party, not wife, not father, not friend, is exactly what you need in order to create a six-figure business or uh, a different type of life. Absolutely right. Without, without a doubt, we can't see our own blind spots. Simple 100%. Simple as that. When I was lost, buried inside my banking life, I came out, burnt out banker, sat by the beach doing nothing. It was in that moment, this old lady came to me with her phone asking me how to do something. And I thought, well, how about if I go and teach old people how to use phones, smartphones? Because I was coming from technology. I knew so much advanced stuff. And that, it was just an instigator for me to go and take an action, do something. Next day, the lady who came up with the, she brought my visiting cards, which I thought I will go and put it in care homes and stuff, teach people, whatever. And she said to me, uh, she was really, really happy lady. And I thought, I thought, why are you so happy? She goes, she loves what she does. She runs around delivering parcels. And I was like, what? I want to do that. I want to be happy. And next day, you know, I got myself a job as a delivery driver, went from being an investment banker to being a delivery driver. But I tell you, Chris, in nine months, I healed this. I could speak the language, become more human and write my first book. 
So you don't have to go to that extreme, but one thing's for sure. Uh, I think Dr. William Dyer speaks about having going through that spiritual death experience where you have to let go of that old self to reinvent yourself. I, I had three options. I sat there thinking, okay, I've got franchise opportunities. One, I can go into offices and replace the vending machines. Second one was be a car broker for financial company where you can set up your own business. And third one was to do a training and development. And it was a no brainer for me because my mom and dad have been professors in universities and medical colleges. And I knew it in an instant that inheritance that I really accomplished was the gift of education. And if, I've, if it's coming to me, it means it flows through me. And I just tapped onto that energy. So I think there's a lot of people out there who are sitting thinking, what do they actually get? Well, you actually got either a lesson from your parents on how not to be or a lesson on how, what skills that they gave you naturally. It could be a learning and development gift. It could be some other skill. And if it flows through you in your genius level, implement it because implementation will give you insights. And when you learn to commercialize your insights, you have a real good business. I wholeheartedly agree. And even if you implement it and the first implementation doesn't quite work out, you'll probably learn more from that than you would have done sat on your hands doing nothing. Nothing. Yeah. 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 So taking action is fundamental, especially when life feels like it's the end of everything. Well, I will tell you exactly what my manager said. No, it's not. You will do something else. Yeah. Even if it feels like you've stopped, you will do something else. You will meet someone else. You... But the key idea here is, A, you've got to know your resources. You've got to look after your health. Once you lose health, it's all gone. So health is fundamental. Relationships, super important. Build a network, good relationship with people, not transactional, but a relationship in which you are there for each other. Right? It, these are fundamental pieces to the puzzle. Right? And finally, embrace change. Change is coming whether you like it or not. It's the only constant, right? Are those your three fundamentals? We're going to get to that in a minute. I think I heard health and uh, embrace change. But yeah, just, yeah. Before we, just before we uh, sort of finish off, uh, Sam, it, it, uh, he's a great coach and a great sage is a word he uses all the time. This is his book, uh, How to Build a Six-Figure Business Without the Overwhelm. And that's really key, without the overwhelm, because so many people get burdened with I must, I must, I must, and it becomes all consuming and then they turn into burnout. And the message from Sam I'm getting is that you've only got a certain amount of time, but if you can't be healthy while you're committing to the journey that you're on, then that's not uh, the best version of yourself. And you've also got sixfigureconsultancy.com, I think is your website. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one of the businesses. The other one is artificial intelligence consultancy. So that's elevateai.com. Uh, and there's a lot of other things that I didn't get myself involved in. But at the moment, these two are my primary focus. All right. Well, the three fundamentals, I ask this all the time for people. And I sometimes think that these, uh, I, I, I've got all these coming together in a book that I'm writing in the future. And I've taken all these three fundamentals and put them into one uh, juicy book. What would be your three sun fundamentals, Sam, to enable you? I think, I, think to I kind leave? of touched on that, didn't I? So uh, embrace change. Yeah. Don't run away from it. Your body will change. Your cells are changing on a daily basis. Change is there. Embrace it. No point fighting it. Uh, find out a way to adjust and accommodate yourself through those changes. Uh, relationships really matter. Build a network of people that are not just transactional. These relationships are going to take you to places you can't even imagine. But identify people who are not good in to be a relationship with. Identify the toxic relationships. Let go of the wrong people. Don't hold on to everyone in your life. Let go of them. You know, you'll be amazed who you will attract, the right energies. And uh, fitness. You cannot ignore health. Even if you can't do exercise, go for a walk. Just Connect with the nature because we are, we have all the elements of nature. You know, we need to connect with that to be in our most natural states. And when we are that, we are the most optimum. That's what I will say, Chris. Well, I, I am 100% with you on those three. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's a great book. But books are only good 
if you do something with the learning and the knowledge. And I think that's where I'm hearing Sam comes from, is that you also need somebody to help you connect the dots, take the lessons and then make sure that you actually apply them. Uh, so go and lean into Sam's work. And thank you for some fantastic insights today and helping us understand that your crisis point was maybe earlier, you know, 30. Depends on the amount of pressure and stress you go through as a from childhood onwards. Your adulthood pain becomes your child, you know, your childhood pain becomes your adulthood dysfunctionalities and they creep up as the pressure rises. And would you say you were grateful for the crisis that you had looking backwards? Yes, yes. Although I'm not very happy about what my family had to go through around me. Because right. They had peace as well. Yeah. Right. But now looking back, if I can look after them, provide for them and be that, be that right person for them, then it's all worth <laughs> Well, I appreciate you for the work you're doing and your models that you shared with me uh, last week are in my notes and I am uh, applying them to my own journey of transformation and systems and uh, leaping myself through into another level. So, uh, Sam Sharma, thank you today. Thank you for having me. Remember, everybody, we have one life. So I love life. Living life.